Uh, one of the wonderful things about being Catholic is that there is actually no ordinary time, but every time of the year is a special time, a time after the coming of our Lord and awaiting his second coming and the final wrapping up of things on earth, but more particularly during the course of the calendar year, everything is a particular season, and of course now we're in the season of Lent. So we all know that during the season of Lent, uh, there are two characteristics. One is some level of fasting or mortification or giving up of um, luxuries and so forth. And the other is trying to increase our prayer and be more faithful and more focused on our need for uh, forgiveness, our need for conversion, and on what Jesus sacrificed in order to make uh, our eternity with God possible. And in that spirit, I wanted to dedicate the show in that way to Lent and use the show to talk about prayer and uh, perhaps some ways to deal with difficulties in prayer and some ways to perhaps find new ways to pray that might help us in times of dryness and so forth. But basically, some tips, mostly coming from the saints, about prayer and how to address prayer in different ways. Now, prayer is a number of things, but the heart of prayer is worshiping and praising and glorifying God and bringing our hearts closer to God by so doing bring God closer to us, in fact, in a way, by so doing. And so I want to start the show by reading a, a canticle from the Old Testament that is used in the Catholic Church as a form of prayer, and actually, as a prayer, in fact, and it was actually part of today's Mass in the traditional rite, today being Ember Saturday, and this prayer was read as one of the readings, so I want to read it. It's a famous canticle from the third chapter of the book of Daniel. It is the praise of God from the three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three young men thrown into the fiery furnace by Nebuchadnezzar because they uh, refused to violate the rules of Judaism and to conform to what the king wanted. And uh, he threw them in the fiery furnace, expecting them, of course, to burn up. They didn't burn up. His servants burned up, in fact, and they walked around in the flames unhurt. Although I think I, they smelled a little bit charred afterwards. And it impressed Nebuchadnezzar so much that he did a 180. So let me read that prayer to get us started. It's a good way, actually, to, to think about what prayer is actually about. Blessed art thou, O Lord, the God of our fathers, praiseworthy and exalted above all forever. And blessed is thy holy and glorious name, praiseworthy and exalted above all for all ages. Blessed art thou in the temple of thy holy glory, praiseworthy and glorious above all forever. Blessed art thou on the holy throne of thy kingdom, praiseworthy and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou upon the scepter of thine divinity, praiseworthy and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou who look into the depths from thy throne upon the cherubim, praiseworthy and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou who walk upon the wings of the wind and on the waves of the sea, praiseworthy and exalted above all forever. Let all thine angels and saints bless thee and praise thee and exalt thee above all forever. Let the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them bless thee and praise thee and exalt thee above all forever. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, praiseworthy and exalted above all forever, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, forever and ever. Amen. Praiseworthy and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou, O Lord, the God of our fathers, and worthy to be praised and glorified forever. Amen. The glory at the end, needless to say, was added to the original canticle from the Old Testament when it was adopted by the Catholic Church. There isn't that glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit 
in the original Jewish version. Okay, it is in fact sort of like a litany. It's a litany of things to praise God about. And you'll see as I get into today's show why that's uh, an appropriate framework uh, from which to discuss prayer. The uh, I've, I neglected to say, and it's very important on this show because this show is by nature more interactive than some of the shows where the, where I just basically want to give a teaching or do a reading from a saint or or talk about something. But this is really a kind of a, a classroom between you and me trying to deal with difficulties in prayer and different ways to learn how to pray. So if you want to call in here, the number is 866-333-6279 or Radio Maria USA Studio if you use Skype. Okay, now as Catholics, we have a tremendous wealth in the church of prayer. Of course, we know that. We have the ultimate prayer, which is a sacrifice of the Mass. We have the divine office, which, by the way, is consists predominantly of of uh, psalms from the Old Testament, so of Jewish prayers that have been adopted by the church and integrated into the church, because of course Judaism was the pre pre messianic church, and we have of course the rosary, all the prayers to Mary, and many of us pray from little booklets and so forth of traditional Catholic prayers. That is very wonderful and a very rich resource, but one should not think that that is the beginning and end and be all of prayer. It isn't. Re uh, reading or silently going through predefined prayers is a wonderful thing to do, but I would almost argue that it's not, it's not the heart of prayer. The heart of prayer is a heart-to-heart, -heart, intimate communion between the individual human soul and God as a person hearing, responding to the voice coming from your soul. That voice may be expressing itself in the words of the prayer that you're reading, or one might simply be reading the prayer as a gesture of devotion or as even an obligation. Not a terrible thing to do, but perhaps not the ultimate form of prayer. But the big point I want to make, really, the main point I simply want to make is that we shouldn't stop there, but we should think about other ways, other forms of prayer. And every soul is different. We're all created absolutely uniquely, or else God wouldn't have bothered to create you or to create Henry or to create Sam or Sally or me or anybody. He created us as unique individuals because he wanted us in our uniqueness. And every soul is different which means inevitably that different forms of prayer fit, better or worse, different people. So, um, so with that, uh, okay, with that background, let me talk about some of those alternatives in uh, alternative forms of prayer. First of all, a good way to always start prayer of any form uh, including, of course, things like things like uh, going to Mass and things like praying the Rosary, but especially mental prayer, is what's called practice the presence of God. Because as sobering as it might be, here I am sitting in my little studio talking into a microphone, and all of you people listening to me are listening to me, but somebody even more important than you is listening to me, and that is God. God is actually here, aware of what I'm doing and paying attention to what I'm doing. And in fact, he is aware and paying attention to all of us at every moment. And practicing the presence of God consists of simply reminding oneself of this fact, basically, and stopping and thinking and becoming aware that you are in the presence of God and he is there, and he is aware of what you're doing, and he's watching, and he's listening, and he is, in some sense, responsive to that. And St. Ignatius of Loyola, in his spiritual exercises, always begins by uh, reminding the participant to 
place themselves in the presence of God, to remind themselves that they are in the presence of God, and God is there in an extremely personal and aware way of what you're about to do. The creator of all existence is aware of you and of me. The creator of existence itself is aware of you and of me. And this is true when we're in our closet at home. It's true when we're in our car. It's true when we go to mass. It's true at every moment. So if one is going to, for instance, pray at home, enter into some one of form of the prayer one of the forms of prayer that i'm going to be talking about the first place to start is to number one practice the presence of god put oneself in a state of awareness that god is there and listening that might be enough to blow you out of your chair right that the god of the universe is there and paying attention to you that could make one's heart sing with joy all by itself, right? And bring one into a state of prayer. But in any case, whether that happens or not, some form of worship, of exaltation of God at the beginning helps bring one into the right state of mind and somehow seems to begin the telephone conversation with God, so to speak. And we may choose different things. Someone might want to just say the Sanctus, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, and so forth. Someone might want to read the, the canticle that I just read of the uh, boys in the fiery furnace. Some people want to, may want to start with the Our Father. If you start with the Our Father, don't start with the Our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, as though you know, you're simply reading the words, but start with our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thinking and, and chewing over, so to speak, each clause, each phrase, and thinking a little bit about what it means. But in any case, it's a good thing to start with some glorification of God. Um, now, at that point, there are any number of things you can do. Um, one thing that is, uh, well, I'm flying by the seat of my pants here. Uh, so I'm going to back up, actually. I'm going to start on another alley. And, and in a few minutes, I'll go into more specific things one might be doing in this state. But before I do that, let me back up another step, which is that there is another form of prayer which is incredibly rich and incredibly valuable and incredibly honoring God, and that is being aware of divine providence. For this, you don't have to be in your little prayer closet. You don't have to be um, in a kind of still way placing yourself in the presence of God. You could be waiting in the checkout line at the supermarket. Uh, you could be walking down the street and stubbing your toe you could be in a traffic jam. This is really, really important to, at every moment, try to be aware that absolutely everything that is happening to you is coming from the hand of God to be the most perfect thing that could be happening to you at that moment. If you are in that state of awareness, then in a sense you are you're practicing the presence of god and you're not only practicing the presence of god in the sense of being aware of his presence and his attention he's paying to you but also you're glorifying him in his omniscience in him his omnipotence and in his love in other words if god is arranging uh who's in front of you in line at the supermarket if he's arranging whether they're out of your favorite brand of toilet paper when you go to the supermarket, if he's arranging whether you make that red light or not, or whether you get stuck at it, then boy, is he involved in your life, and boy, is he powerful, because he's doing that not only in your life, but he's doing that in everybody's life. And it is a tremendous act of the glorification of the omniscience and omnipotence and love of God to simply acknowledge his divine providence at every moment. 
And if you acknowledge that everything that happens to you, uh, Padre Pio said that. He said, we receive the sweet things that come from the hand of God we should and kiss his hand for them. We should receive the bitter things that come from the hand of God also and kiss his hand for them. To receive everything that comes to you as a gift from God, good things and bad things, things that cause suffering and things that cause joy, is a wonderful way to glorify God. Now, you might say, if he's arranging everything out of pure love and pure omnipotence, why do so many, quote, bad things, close quote, happen? Why do so many things that cause suffering and unpleasantness and so forth happen? If he's all good and all loving and all powerful, wouldn't everything that happens be pleasant? The answer to that is no. Everything that happens is good. Everything that happens is the best possible thing that could happen. Not everything that happens is pleasant. The reason that for that is very simple. How can everything be good even if they cause suffering? The answer is what good means depends on what the purpose is. Something is good to the extent that it serves the purpose. You know, uh, I've used this example before, but a pencil is good for taking notes, but it's bad for writing on a blackboard. A piece of chalk is good for writing on a blackboard, but it's bad for taking notes. The purpose is what determines whether something is good or not. The purpose of life on earth is not to have a pleasant time. God would like us to be happy, but that's not the fundamental purpose of life on earth. The fundamental purpose of life on earth is to develop the love of God, the virtue, the self-discipline, and so forth, to be able to be a citizen of heaven for all eternity. The purpose of life on earth is to get to heaven, essentially. And if everything were pleasant, if we lived in, excuse the ex example, but Hugh Hefner's Chicago Playboy Mansion, we would not have a very good chance of getting to heaven. The purpose is to get to heaven, and everything is good that happens to us because it's designed by God to help us to get to heaven. And since I am um, claiming to be presenting this material, so to speak, as coming from um, the saints, I'd better find my notes here. And uh, this might sound familiar to some of you, what I'm saying, because it's in fact St. Ignatius's first principle and foundation, which I will read. It's the, it's the fundamental basis of all of his spirituality. And it's certainly the basis of the uh, Ignatian exercises. And I'll simply read it. It's only a few sentences. Man is created to praise, reverence, and serve God our Lord, and by this means to save his soul. All other things on the face of the earth are created for man to help him fulfill the end for which he is created. From this it follows that man is to use these things to the extent that they will help him to attain his end. Likewise, he must rid himself of them in so far as they prevent him from attaining it. Therefore, we must make ourselves indifferent to all created things in so far as it is left to the choice of our free will and is not forbidden. Acting accordingly for our part, we should not prefer health to sickness, riches to poverty, honor to dishonor, a long life to a short one, and so forth, in, in all things we should desire and choose only those things which will best help attain the end for which we are created. End of the quote. That is referring to the things that we choose. Um, it also extends to the things that God chooses for us. In fact, anything that God chooses for us, we know a priori. We know before we're out of the starting gate that it is the best thing that could happen for us to attain the end for which we are created, which is to save our souls. Now, uh, back to the uh, mainstream. So the God is arranging everything in our lives. If we, if we respond to things that happen in that way, we are worshiping God. How's that? We're worshiping God in getting stuck at the red light. Now, let's say... We just make it through the green light. 
maybe even the yellow light. I'll leave that up to you. But we just make it through the light and save ourselves a frustrating wait at a long red light. That we should also praise God for, because he arranged that also. Whether the light was red or whether the light was green or whether the light was yellow, he arranged it. If we run the red light, he arranged the red light, but he didn't arrange our running it. That's the one thing that we can take credit for is our own sin. So anyway, okay. Um, you might, you might, uh, you know, you might think this is a little bit strong uh, reliance on the truth of divine providence. You might want to object on the basis of free will, you know, and the guy that, that rammed into the side of my car, he had free will, that wasn't God arranging it and so forth. The way to resolve the apparent contradiction between free will and the totality of divine providence is, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a straw man. It's very easy to resolve that apparent contradiction. And um, that's not the topic of today's show. I do have shows where that's the topic. But in any case, the, the simple way to get around that problem is to realize that God is outside of time. Everything we choose to do and everything everyone else chooses to do, it comes from their free will. But God knows about all of those choices beforehand, and he weaves all of our destiny together out of the threads of all of our individual good wills. So, uh, excuse me, out of the threads of all of our individual free wills. <laughs> Would that they were good wills, but they're not. So, Receiving everything as divine providence is in itself prayer. And the flip side of that coin is receiving anything as not divine providence is in some sense blasphemy. Because it is saying either that God isn't all loving, he isn't all powerful, he isn't all knowing, or he doesn't care about you. It has to be one of those things. If it's if all of those things are true, if, if God cares about you, if he's all loving, if he's all knowing, if he's all powerful, why would he let something bad happen to you? The answer is he doesn't let something bad happen to you. He just lets really unpleasant things happen to you. And, and you know, most of us are in the United States or in the Western world or whatever, but just think, you know, of, of the poor people in war-torn countries and in Yemen or in the Ukraine or in any of the other 18 or 20 countries around the world where daily life is agony. Um, you know, there's a lot more, you know, there's a reason why the Hail Holy Queen talks about life on earth as being this valley of tears. However, it's always good to remember that in this valley of tears, uh, St. Teresa of Avila said, when we get to heaven, we'll realize that the worst life on earth, consisting of the most horrible continuous suffering, amounted to no more than a night in a bad motel. Because we, when we get to heaven, we'll be there for all eternity. So even a hundred lousy years or horrible years on earth, if it gets us to heaven, will seem of as insignificant as a night in a bad motel. She said in, of course, because they didn't have motels in those days, but it was the equivalent. Now, who am I to talk about the divine providence involved even in, in suffering and in being subjected to evil, right? What authority do I have? It's a very good question. None. <laughs> How's that? None. But I am, I am trying to relay the wisdom of the saints, not the wisdom of yours truly. And in that light, I want to read a rather extensive passage from Father Dolindo. Some of you may know he certainly uh, had a very um, full of suffering life. Um, and he also was a saint. <laughs> I mean, not a canonized saint, as to my knowledge, but, but effectively a saint, if, if you know what I mean. So I'm going to read a passage. Some of you may know of him from the Surrender Novena, which I'm a great fan of. But this is a more extensive prayer of his and meditation of his. So here goes. The evil of the world, our sins and our errors, cause us great suffering while we are searching for good. 
the suffering is double. At the beginning of the spiritual life, we feel a painful blow due to the confusion of the world. We suffer more for this confusion and from injustice than we do from our love of our offended God. When our love for God grows, then we feel more pain for the offense to him, and rather than speaking, we feel the need to repair this hurt. We walk in a sea where all are drowning and where few are in the ark of good health. We walk among the plague-stricken and among those who hide their sores with elegant vestments, among people who slide into the abyss and do not realize it. We are among small worms that haughtily lift against the Lord their foreheads slippery with filth. What suffering it is to be able to do nothing, and yet God gives us the weapons to fight, provided we live with Jesus. We must have faith in the providence of God. He knows how to draw forth good from this evil. God is not defeated by any of his creations, but rather he is a king infinitely great who lets so much evil loose just because he is infinitely great and good. You see a painter who mixes up his colors, who spills together black and white and green with blue and so forth, but you know he is an artist, so you have faith in his talent. Looking at the disorders of the world, you turn your eyes to God, who is infinite good and providence. Have faith that he will dominate that disorder. Turn to him so that he will take care of it, without worrying yourself. So often, great worry hides a lack of faith. Aim your weapons at evil and offer your suffering, offer the pain of your miseries. It is a treasure that you possess. By offering them to God, you make an act of humility and of faith. God is powerful in his use of your sufferings when they are causing you pain, and you offer them to Jesus. Do not worry about what you can do. Instead, pray silently with humble and faithful humility. Prayer carries into battle the general's plan. It brings you new supplies from heaven. You pray, and graces rain down, and the angels go on the march. Prayer climbs into its plane like a, a fighter plane or a bomber climbing up on high. It climbs into the sky and from on high it will rain down the bombs which will destroy the plans of Satan. Pray to God with faith and with surety. Lord, end this evil, I beg you, through your glory. If an, a dry word comes to your lips, give it to him so he can make it bloom. If you speak full of the joy of life, praise God who has filled you with it. In general, when you are unhappy and humiliated, that is when God is most present. Act with simplicity and never be upset, never be discouraged, because if you become discouraged, you search for yourself. If you want to succeed, love not being able to succeed when you want, but calmly wait for God's time. You need patience, tenacity, and calm. Patience is the perfect way, and with patience you will win. How mysterious is it to speak of God who has everything present and can only speak as one who has everything present? We, little atoms, cannot do anything before him, eternal trinity, power, wisdom, and love, than to worship, thank, and pray. In the midst of the fluctuation of the centuries, we are like a small twig of straw, overwhelmed by the waves of the tumultuous open ocean, and how can we presume to rise up as judges of God? Let us humble ourselves and treasure the small particle of time that is granted to us to do good. We cannot evaluate and even less criticize the profound reasons why God wants or allows so many events in the life of the centuries and in that of the church. He alone knows what is right, holy, and harmonious in this life for his glory and for the good and eternal happiness of his creatures. We know that it is infinite wisdom and infinite love, and we must trust in him and abandon ourselves to his love. Let us get used to humiliating ourselves deeply before God with feelings of great trust and great love. It is so sweet to feel in the hands of the Almighty it is so reassuring to feel entrusted to his wisdom and his love. What does it matter 
that we do not understand all that he disposes of or permits in the world. It is enough for us to join his will as a child joins that of his parents, entrusting himself completely to them. Amen. Amen. So that was a beautiful meditation, one could say, on trusting ourselves to God and to divine providence in the midst of all of the turmoil and suffering and battles of this world. By the way, having read this passage from Father Delindo, reminds me of another very easy way to pray, sometimes very easy, sometimes very hard, which is to read the saints, to read the saints. If you're completely dry and you can't feel anything in your heart towards God, pick up something. Maybe pick up St. Faustina's diary. Maybe pick up something by Father Delindo. Maybe pick up something about Padre Pio and try to just read it with attention. And that's going to help in two ways. One is it is going to actually inspire us and shed light on, on what we're going through. The second thing actually is a little bit spacier, uh, you know, a little bit further out there, which is that saint is going to know you're reading them. It's going to draw the attention of the saint who you're reading about or whose words you're reading. So if you're reading St. Ignatius of Loyola, I'm convinced that St. Ignatius of Loyola knows you're reading him and is interceding for you or trying to inspire you. If you're reading about Padre Pio, he is looking down from heaven at you while you're reading about him and so forth. So it's kind of a, a double benefit because on one side, you're being inspired to, to have thoughts and feelings that bring you close to God. And on the other side of the same communication channel, the saint is uh, you know, throwing down a, a, a life rope to you. We're in Lent. <laughs> How hard-hearted you must be to watch the movie The Passion of the Christ and not have it be prayer, right? If when you watch that movie, how can you not become aware in a in a very special way the depths of the suffering of Christ, the extent of his love for us, the extent of the you know his humiliation, his suffering and and his patience, his his patient love even for those who are torturing him. Uh, that is prayer. That is prayer. To compassionate Christ in his suffering is a wonderful form of prayer. That's, in fact, why we have the Stations of the Cross, is a way of compassionating Christ in what he went through for us. As long as I'm talking about the way of the cross, doing the way of the cross, which is a absolutely wonderful practice uh, during Lent, perhaps for every day during Lent, not just for Fridays. Many of us enjoy doing a procession of the way of the cross with a church group and so forth, which is wonderful. But um, some, some of us do the way of the cross on our own with a little booklet of the prayers of St. Francis or St. Al Alphonsus Liguori for the way of the cross and so forth. But I'd like to suggest a different way, of, an additional way of praying the way of the cross, which is simply to begin at the first station, look at the picture, Think about what's going on. Place yourself in that situation and, and to some extent, you know, make yourself present to Jesus being condemned. Make yourself present to Jesus receiving the cross for the first time. Make yourself present to him falling under the weight of the cross and being, you know, mocked and beaten to get up and so forth. And just think, just think, just think. Um you'll be surprised, perhaps, at the thoughts that come to your mind. They might be how absolutely impossible it is to do what Jesus did. Think of how impossible it would be to be beaten and scourged and mocked and so forth, and then being handed the cross and to embrace it lovingly and gratefully because you know that this is what you came to earth for. Or to be uh, silent 
when you're being you know mocked and condemned to be patient i I, i'm mixing up because you know we we have the um sorrowful mysteries and we also have the way of the cross so i don't want to mix them up too much to to come to the women of jerusalem and to not be thinking about yourself but to be thinking about the women of jerusalem while you're being tortured to death just think about what that would take just think about how much he loves us just think about how helpless hopeless it is for us to do anything resembling what he did but maybe we can kind of um I, it's hide under his skirt, so to speak. Maybe we can somehow rely on his patience and his love of neighbor and his perseverance and so forth. And, and then ask him to let us rely on his because there's no way that we can pass the test on our own. Whatever. But don't feel like you're morally obligated to read the prayers of other people. You're praying in order to be there, to be there with God, to be there with Jesus. If the prayers of other people help you be there with God, be there with Jesus, terrific. But sometimes they stand in the way. Sometimes you read, one reads the prayers instead of being there, if you see what I mean. Okay, what else do I have here? Um, the okay other ways other ways of prayer other ways of compassionating is simply to look at a picture i talked about watching the passion of the christ which will force one to compassionate with jesus to empathize with jesus by the way many of the saints i'm trying to think of who exactly i think mary of agrita i, I think saint bridget uh, Jesus said, uh, in both of those cases, or in Mary of Agreda, it might have been the Blessed Virgin Mary who said it. Also, St. Faustina, I believe, Jesus said, there is no prayer more valuable to him than, than um, compassionating the passion, meditating on the passion, just thinking about the passion, thinking about what Jesus did for us, uh, you know, trying to console him in his passion is among the most valuable of prayers. It's not saying a prayer, it's sitting there and trying to hold that in mind. And one thing that helps one do that is looking at a picture. Look at the picture of the face of Jesus in the Shroud of Turin photo. Just sit there and look at the picture of Jesus' face and of his nobility and of his patience. That's actually a photograph, that's a photograph of what he looked like when he died and just you know be in amazement at who he was and talk to him similarly it takes a better photograph but if you ha ever have the opportunity to look at a good photograph of the back of jesus from the shroud and you see it looks like herringbone you know herringbone fabric with you know with with the constant um zigzag lines of the herringbone that's what his back looked like from the scourges there wasn't a square centimeter that wasn't cut open by the scourges his whole back and the reason it looks a little bit like herringbone is because there were two two torturers one on each side scourging him from you know one from the left and one from the right and so the scourge lines are crisscrossed and his entire back is almost flayed. I mean, that is meditating on the passion of Christ. It's not meditating in like one might imagine needing to be a saint in order to be able to, you know, reach the heights of meditation. But it is the same fundamental dynamic with the same fundamental fruits. You are compassionating Jesus in his passion. Now, what do you do if you have dryness in prayer? I hope that some of you don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm afraid that most of you probably do know what I'm talking about. When, when prayer is totally distasteful to you, you don't feel any warmth in the presence of God, 
You don't feel any, the technical term is consolation. You don't have warm and gushy feelings while you're praying at all. You might as well be, you know, reading a shopping list or something. What do you do then? Well, there are lots of things you can do then. For, uh, first of all, you can appreciate the fact this is really important. It may be relevant for some of you and not relevant for some of you, but appreciate the fact that be, being having dryness in prayer can be good news or bad news. We tend to think of it as bad news. We tend to think of it that, you know, God is not paying attention to us, that we failed, that we're out of communication with God, you know, that he's cut us off. That's the enemy speaking usually. So the first thing you have to do is decide whether, in fact, you have done something to alienate God, basically whether you've sinned. If you have, of course, go to confession. Uh, if you've stopped doing something that you should be doing, if you've been whatever, whatever the fault is, first do look and see if there's some serious fault there. If maybe you used to be dedicated to praying for 15 minutes every morning and you dropped it you know, a week or two ago, well, then maybe the reason that you have such dryness in prayer is that you're not holding up your end. But if you're basically doing the same basic stuff that you were doing before you had the dryness in prayer, then the dryness in prayer is likely to be a good sign, a good sign, because God in the beginning, when he is trying to woo us, tends to give us a lot of consolation in prayer to basically infuse us with a desire to pray and a love of prayer. But we have to be weaned from, I think as St. Paul says, we have to be weaned from milk and, and um, introduced to solid foods. We have to stop relying on God to keep us on the right path by, you know, it's sort of like a father um, actually, my father used to do this, but uh, when he came home at the end of the day, he would have his pockets full of candy so that his children would race up to him and e be eager to see him and greedily, of course, reach our hands into his pockets to get the candy. So, you know, my, my father was kind of um, uh, bribing us to love him in a funny kind of a way. And God does that in the beginning with sweetness and prayer. But my, that's not really the, the love and eagerness to see him that my father wanted. What he wanted was for us to be responsive to him and be glad to see him, not just get the candy that he had in his pocket. So at a certain point, of course, he should stop having pockets full of candy and seeing if the lesson took. And that's what God does with dryness and prayer. You know, it's your father coming home without candy in his pockets, and he wants to see that you're still glad to see him. So it can easily be a good sign. Now, there's another really, really important reason why God has to lead us through periods of dryness and prayer. By the way, I'm saying this because it's Lent. So, you know, Lent is the period when we pay more attention to prayer, and Lent is the period when God, in some sense, you know, prayer is is like the central theme, the central agenda for the period. So anyway, back to what I was saying. The other reason why God leads us through periods of dryness in prayer is so that we do not get confused and think that we can take credit for our love of God, that we can take credit for our desire to serve him, that we can take credit for, you know, all of, uh, you know, our inspirations, if we're inspired in prayer, that we can't own anything. We can't uh, take, take credit for it. And the picture that comes to my mind, and may be somewhat corny, is imagine that you're the author, you're Shakespeare, and you're Shakespeare writing his sonnets, and you're writing them with a pencil. And you're writing beautiful sonnet after beautiful sonnet after beautiful sonnet. And the pencil is in your hand saying, oh, I'm awfully clever. Oh, am I a great artist? And so forth. And the pencil starts thinking that it is writing this sonnet. 
because you're writing through the pencil. Well, if you were Shakespeare in that situation and you were smart, you would put down the pencil and let it sit there for a week. That poor pencil sitting there saying, oh, I thought I had all these great inspirations and I can't even think of a word. Do you see? The pencil has to be left to its own devices to realize that the good it was doing was not coming from it, but it was coming through it from God, or excuse me, from the author. And he owed everything to the author. And that is our case. There is nothing good, especially in prayer, especially in love of God, in faith, in love, in hope, that we can take credit for. It is God doing something through us, and he has to put down the pencil from time to time so that we recognize our misery and our helplessness and our worthlessness without God being the one who's picking up the pencil and writing with it. So um, it's a way of God training us not to trust in ourselves, not to rely on ourselves, not to take credit for things as though we were sovereign over them, but to trust in him. And there's a beautiful prayer by uh, Claude de la Colombière, which unfortunately I don't have in front of me, so I'll have to just characterize it. But he is, is a prayer to Jesus, and he's telling Jesus that he doesn't, he doesn't trust in his good works, he doesn't trust in his self-sacrifices and his mortifications. He doesn't trust in his goodness. He doesn't trust in his love. He doesn't trust in his faith. He just trusts in who Jesus is, in who Jesus is. And he is totally naked, totally impoverished, has nothing to offer at all. His trust and his confidence is not in himself at all. It is in who Jesus is. I remember being struck when Father uh, Groeschel said at one time in a talk that when he dies, when he dies, he's just going to throw himself 100% on the mercy of Jesus. There's absolutely nothing in what he did or in who he was that he is going to bring to the table. The only thing he's going to bring to the table, so to speak, to negotiate with, is is Jesus's mercy. So with that, I've come to the end of this hour. So I hope you found it worthwhile. And I've certainly enjoyed it. And um, I hope it's given you some good ideas. And uh, don't be discouraged. Oh, last point, very last point. If you're totally discouraged and have nothing good to say to God and nothing to say in the way of prayer or anything, then turn that into your prayer. Sit there, try to place yourself in the presence of God. I would say speak out loud, maybe very softly, so that you stay on track, because if you try to stay silent, your mind wanders more. And um, just say, God, I'm just making this up, so I'm not saying you say this, but it's just an example. God, you know, I used to feel love for you. I don't feel anything now. I used to like prayer. I don't feel anything now. I used to feel warm and gushy feelings when I went to Mass. Now I'm just bored to tears. I'm sorry that I distract myself at Mass. I'm sorry that this. I'm sorry that that. There's nothing that I can see that I can do about it. Um, you know, I certainly still want to get to heaven. You know, I know that you still exist, but I'm at the end of my rope. Whatever it is, bring it to God. That's prayer also. And with that, I think I'm going to stop. And uh, I will play uh, to the end. It's up to the station when they want to cut it off. Uh, and they are, I know they have deadlines and stuff like that. But I'll, I'll go back. I'll play that beautiful hymn, Gregorian chant, and uh, which is also another thing that can sometimes bring us into prayer. And I just wanted to close by thanking you, wishing you a good Lent, a fruitful Lent, not necessarily a happy fr Lent, but a fruitful Lent. And um, I hope you join us again next week, same time, same place, for Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism on Radio Maria. This is Roy Shoman saying,
Bye for now. Oh, the music will come up in a moment.